Excellent. Uh, as you know, General Petraeus is combatant commander now for a 20-nation region, Central Command region. And just to quickly summarize, it's basically all the Arab states over to and it's all the so-called Stan countries that used to be part of the former Soviet Union. And then it's what I call the axis of anxiety, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan. Now, I'm going to leave to this crowd uh, at, at, at a Navy-oriented event to discuss Somali pirates and Persian Gulf waterway issues, which are among General Petraeus's purview. Uh, and I want to spend this opening period, before we involve you in the discussion, on a little bit more about Iraq, then Afghanistan, and then Pakistan. And again, invite you to go wherever you'd like in the discussion with the general, but uh, I'll leave uh, naval issues, which are still in his domain, uh, to you if you will. Uh, I wanted to ask, General, one more question about Iraq, which is really how you feel about things today and how you would summarize the main challenges. I think General Odierno has highlighted the sectarian issues in the north, uh, and I know you've been concerned about those as well. Uh, some people identify those as the main challenge up and around Kirkuk and other areas where the Kurdish region uh, it meets the main part of Iraq. Others talk about the so-called sons of Iraq, the Sunni fighters that you partnered with, and, and worry that the current Shia-led government may not incorporate them enough into the security forces or the government. Uh, I don't know how you would prioritize your top worries and overall how you feel about our prospects for continued improvement in the situation. Well, the, the bumper sticker for Iraq, I think, still, as Ambassador Crocker and I used to uh, state it, is still substantial progress, fragile, and reverse. Uh, because there are innumerable challenges that face Iraq. You mentioned some of them, the continuing uh, ethnic issues between Arabs and Kurds. There are certainly uh, sectarian problems that, that persist between Sunni and Shia, and then there are various minority elements as well, Turkmen, Yazidis, Shabak Christians, uh, and so forth. So all of those are present, and sadly, there are still certainly Al-Qaeda elements in Iraq. There are other Sunni extremist uh, elements, Ansar al-Islam, and a couple of others. And there are Shia extremist elements that are still funded, trained, equipped, uh, and to varying degrees directed by Iran, lying low, uh, they were defeated in March and April of 2008 uh, when Prime Minister Maliki ordered Iraqi forces into Basra, and that precipitated quite a substantial fight uh, between the Iraqi and coalition forces and the uh, Shia militia elements. Uh, but they're still there. They're under the surface. They are still a force that, that might and should be reckoned with at some point in time. Uh, beyond that, there are, uh, again, substantial political challenges that face the country, and it really is about politics now. It is about can Iraqi political leaders uh, continue to come together, as they did uh, just a few days ago when they agreed on the election law. I mean, this is a little bit characteristically Iraq. Um, you know, the 11th hour came, and they didn't have a law. The 12th hour came, they still didn't have a law. Um, but a few days after that, they, with quite a bit of drama, uh, a fair amount of shouting, not too much shooting, uh, and so forth, they actually did reach uh, a, a law that accommodated the various interests adequately. And one of the features of Iraq, interestingly, is that because of the Constitution, something I think that was uh, gotten right in the early days of Ambassador Bremer and the CPA and so forth, that constitution requires, because of the makeup of the country and the political landscape, it requires uh, reaching across ethno-sectarian boundaries. Uh, you cannot pass a law uh, if you cannot get uh, not just Arabs but also Kurds, uh, if you cannot also get Sunni uh, as well as Shia, and so forth. There's no one bloc that can cobble together enough votes in the Council of Representatives uh, to ram a vote through. Uh, and there are also significant checks and balances where each of the members of the Presidency Council, and that includes a Kurdish president, uh, Sunni and Shia Arab vice presidents, each of them has a veto. So again, you must achieve something that, is a, that meets the different requirements of the different major groups uh, in Iraq. And so the, again, the question I think is, uh, with an election law now, with the elections coming now, I think the latest date is January 18th of next year, in the, that'll be the first election. The real election is the election that takes place when the new members of the Council of Representatives uh, seek to 
gather enough votes to agree on a prime minister, a president, speaker of the council representatives, the major ministry uh, leaders, and so forth. And that is going to be very challenging. It took, I think, something like six or seven months last time. Uh, and we all hope it will not take that long this time, but it, it may very well. On the other hand, there is a government in place that will continue in a caretaker status and I think can, can do that job adequately. So it's going to be a very interesting period. Uh, it, it, Iraq is, sits at a crucial position geopolitically, uh, obviously on a variety of different fault lines, again, between uh, sectarian groupings, ethnic groupings, uh, and on oil reserves that are officially the third largest in the world, may well be the second or even largest in the world, uh, top 10 natural gas uh, reserves. It's the land of the two rivers, uh, as something no other Arab oil producing country has, and that is uh, fresh water in addition to oil. So it has agricultural potential, most sulfur in the world. Again, in people who are reasonably well educated uh, and the history of, of central <laughs> government. So that it has an enormous number of blessings uh, if it can just learn how, to, how all of its citizens can work together. Uh, progressive manner so that they can all enjoy the fruits of these blessings. Right. One last question on Iraq, uh, as I think many people know in this audience, but many in the country may not remember, we still have almost twice as many troops in Iraq as in Afghanistan, uh, even as the debate has shifted more towards the latter. Uh, as you well know, and as you've been an architect of the proposal along with General Odierno and the Iraqi leadership to reduce our presence in Iraq quite dramatically starting early yeah. in the new year. Uh, obviously, having approved that and helped design it, you must uh, agree with it. But uh, just how concerned are you that this process of taking 60 to 70,000 troops out in the first two thirds of 2010 will uh, unsettle the situation? Well, we think it's doable. Uh, again, this was based on recommendations from General Odierno and, and from me uh, early on in the uh, new presidency. And we think it's a sound approach. Uh, on, it is on track so far. Uh, the big recent development, we moved our combat forces from Iraq cities. Yes, there's some coordination elements, some advisors and so forth, but our large units are out of their cities. And uh, there will be sub substantial changes as we obviously go from about 116 to 118,000 on the ground right now to under 50,000 by the end of August next year. That is a substantial uh, off-ramp, if you will, and it's going to be particularly steep in the latter part of the spring and summer next year. But again, we think it is, it is doable. There are over 670,000 or so Iraqi Security Force members now from uh, the different interior and defense ministry elements. Uh, they have, by and large, shouldered uh, the, the majority of the security tasks in their country by now. We certainly still work very closely with them, particularly with their special operations elements that are quite numerous and capable uh, in, in providing a variety of different forms of enabling uh, and assistance to them. But uh, they are the ones doing the operations. And uh, we think that that is something that can be sustained. We will completely change our mission at the end of August next year and uh, be strictly in the advise and assist mode rather than still having combat elements. Uh. Although it's, I think, fair to say, and correct me if, I, if I'm wrong, but we'll still have some latent combat capability should the Iraqis decide they want to ask us to help provide that even after August. Well, absolutely. And again, what we will be doing is taking conventional brigade combat teams and essentially turning them into advise and assist brigades, augmenting them with substantial numbers of commissioning leaders so that they can partner uh, with our Iraqi counterpart elements throughout the country, and certainly still providing some of the enablers. I mean, they don't yet have F-16s. They don't have uh, some of the more exotic uh, aspects of our intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance uh, capabilities and so forth. So uh, in many respects, we'll still provide that. But over time, I think it will evolve into a more traditional security assistance arrangement. Uh, but certainly, again, there's another year and a half to go after that. I think it's doable. Uh, you do touch wood when you see it. Uh, we don't proclaim ourselves as optimists or pessimists, but rather as realists. And the reality in Iraq is that everything is hard, uh, but there has progress and it has.